Hello friends, welcome to Rajesh Data Engineering. In this video, I'm going to talk about interview questions across Spark development. In this video series, we are talking about interview question across different sections. In our previous videos, we talked about performance optimization, Delta Lake and Spark core concepts. In this video, I will focus more on Spark development related interview questions. Let's get started with first question. What is schema or what is infer schema? What is the difference between infer schema and explicit schema? These are the different questions related to schema. I have already posted one video, video number 95. In that video, I talked about schema, how to create a schema in different ways. You can watch that. And coming to schema, schema is nothing but defining the structure of a data set or a data frame in PySpark development. One data frame would contain number of columns and also data type. So in order to define that, we can use schema. So it is going to tell what is the column name? What is the data type of that? It can accept null value or not. It is going to define these attributes that is called schema. Coming to infer schema, whenever we are reading data from a big data file formats such as uh, CSV, JSON or Parquet, we can explicitly specify the schema in order to read that particular data or we can ask Spark Engine to infer the schema. Infer schema means Spark Engine will scan the entire data then it will come to a conclusion of automated schema for that. But that is uh, not recommended because infer schema that is uh, creating negative impact on the performance. So it is always better to avoid infer schema. Coming to explicit schema, we can define the schema for that particular uh, big data file format. Then we can supply that uh, defined schema while reading the data from that big data file format. So that is going to improve the performance because Spark Engine will not scan the entire data files. So uh, this is schema and uh, I hope you understood the difference between infer schema and explicit schema. We have to mention infer schema that is going to impact the performance. So it's always recommended not to use infer schema, but we have to go with explicit schema. Right. Moving on to next question. How to create input parameter in Databricks or what is widget? These are the different questions. And in order to answer this question, we have to tell widget, you know, that, that is a concept in uh, Databricks using which we can create input parameter. And we can also talk about deep utility command through which we can create widgets. And we can also talk about types of widgets. Uh, we are having text widgets, uh, drop down widgets, uh, combo box, drop uh, multi select. You know, these are the different types of widgets. And we can also talk about the default value. Whenever we are defining uh, widgets, let it be uh, text or uh, multi select, we can define default values also. And also we can talk about uh, get command in DB utility. Uh, how we can get the value from the widgets into one of the variable. Also, we can talk about how to remove particular widget and or all the widgets at once. Uh, these are the different um, information we need to provide for this question. Moving on to the next question, how to convert RDD to data frame? This is one of the very simple and basic question mainly asked for junior developers. So in order to convert um, uh, RDD into data frame, it's a simple function that is 2DF that we need to use. Let's say we are having RDD called RDD1 that we need to convert to data frame. Then DF equal to RDD1 dot 2DF then open and close a bracket. This is a very simple answer. And in case someone has hands on experience in uh, PySpark, then they can answer this easily. So in order to check if the candidate is having really no hands on experience or only theoretical knowledge, in order to check interviewer might ask this simple question. Moving on to the next question, how to create data frame from big data file formats such as uh, CSV, JSON, Parquet. I have already posted one video, how to create a data frame out of CSV file. You can watch that. And in order to answer this question, we have to start with Spark Reader, Spark.read that is called Spark Reader. So we have to use Spark Reader and uh, we have to specify format. Um, let's say we are going to read CSV file format, then we have to use format within that we have to give CSV or uh, respective file format, let it be JSON or Parquet. And also we have to talk about different options available for these big data file formats. Let's say CSV, for CSV we are having different options like uh, infer schema true or header true delimiter same delimiter can be uh, specified using separator SCP and also we can uh, talk about mode um, you know it's a bad record uh, handling mode 
and uh, we can uh, specify a schema option you know these are the different things you know we can specify while reading data frame csv similarly for json you know one of the common option is multi select it, it is true or false and um, we can talk about these different options also along with data frame reader right moving on to the next question what is msck command in spark this is one of the popular command msck stands for meta store consistency check uh, this is used in order to maintain the consistency in hive meta store let's say we are going to create a table uh, directly on the parquet file so we are not going to create the table based on the delta engine instead of that directly we are creating uh, table on top of uh, partition to parquet file so what happens is you now the table will be created the table will be pointing to those uh, partition file but the meta uh, meta store hive meta store is not updated with the underlying data files and their location as a result whenever we have to perform data analytics on top of the table then delta engine cannot uh, understand you know where those files are located so as a result we will we will not get consistent uh, output so in order to uh, avoid that as soon as we have created uh, a table directly on top of parquet files we have to run msck repair command then it will scan all the underlying files then it will update the meta store uh, hive meta store once it's done then in the subsequent uh, data analytics it will uh, return consistent uh, output so uh, with the help of uh, msck command we can maintain the consistency for a particular table in hive meta store right moving on to the next question what is fsck command in spark this is also quite similar to msck but different functionality fsck stands for file system consistency check um, whenever we are creating delta table in uh, uh, pyspark development delta engine will be will maintain transaction log i have already posted one video about uh, delta engine internal in case you have watched you can understand so it is uh, creating json log files whenever we are performing certain operation in the delta table so whenever we are performing certain dml operations on top of delta table delta uh, engine will update the transaction log let's say we are deleting certain data file then it is going to mention in the log file saying that this particular data file parquet file is no longer related to this particular table so that will be made so whenever we are performing subsequent operations uh, delta engine will refer the transaction log as a result it is going to take only the active or latest record files and it will it will make the uh, process but let us assume you know our delta table that is created on top of uh, data lake storage uh, file so in the data lake storage uh, someone you know without having proper understanding deleted few data files so that deletion is not happening through delta engine so delta engine is not aware of those deleted files so as a result there is a inconsistency between file system and the transaction log the transaction log is going to tell now these are the active files but that active file one of the active file that is no longer available in the file system so in order to avoid that we can run fsck repair command then delta engine will check the transaction log and it will compare the file system if any of the files are deleted manually by someone then it is going to update the same in the transaction log uh, log file so as a result we can get consistent output in the subsequent operations so this is the use of fsck command right moving on to the next question what is the difference between struct type and struct field struct type and struct field you know these are the methods uh, used to define schema struct type basically defining uh, the record you know it's a record uh, structure for a particular data let's say we are having one data frame which is having four columns then the number of columns can be defined using uh, struct type and coming to struct field it is going to define each and every field within that struct type let's say uh, in that struct type we are having four columns but the first column it's a first name then what is the name of that column it is first name what is the data type of that string it can accept null value or not so those values will be defined with the help of struct field and coming to struct type uh, struct type that is not only for defining the entire uh, record uh, structure of a data frame even we can have one particular column with nested structure for that also we can go with struct type let's say we are having a column name which is internally divided into three columns first name middle name last name so even in order to define nested column we can use struct type i have already posted one video video number 93 in case you want to understand uh, the difference between these two you can watch that video moving on to the next question what is the difference between map type and array type map type it's similar to python dictionary so it is going to keep key value pairs 
So in our uh, data frame, we are going to have a column which will uh, keep key value pairs. Let's say we are uh, going to maintain uh, home appliances in one of the column. So let's say uh, television, that is a key. And what is the brand of that? It's uh, Philips. So we are going to maintain key value pair. Okay, what is the home appliance name and what is the brand? So we are going to maintain key value pair. So for that particular column, we can go with map data type. And coming to array data type, let's say in a particular column, we can have more than one value. Then we can go with array data type. Uh, let's say uh, we are having uh, some you know, employee information. One of the column is hobbies. So one employee, one person can have multiple uh, hobbies like uh, playing football, uh, listening uh, to music. You now one particular person can have multiple values for a particular column. Then we can go with array data type. So basically, these are the differences between map type and array type. And uh, I have already posted one video about the difference between struct type and map type. You can refer that as well. Moving on to next question. What is the difference between distinct and drop duplicates? Now, these uh, two are the methods available in uh, PySpark. Coming to distinct and uh, drop duplicates, both are used to remove the duplicate from the data frame. But uh, the difference is distinct that is removing the duplicate in case we are having exact uh, duplicate of all the columns in a particular data frame. Let's say we are having uh, two columns, uh, sorry, two records with all the columns having same value. Then it one of the uh, one of the record can be eliminated with the help of distinct. But uh, in case you now we are having duplicate for a subset of columns, then distinct cannot remove the duplicates. For that, we can go with drop duplicates. So with the help of drop duplicates, um, uh, we can uh, remove the duplicates by considering all the columns or subset of the column. So within drop duplicate function, we have to supply the subset of columns. So uh, these are the key differences between distinct and drop duplicates. Basically, drop duplicate can act as uh, distinct and also it can act as a subset uh, removal of uh, duplicates. Right. Moving on to next question, what is UDF? What is the impact of UDF in performance? UDF stands for user defined function. Let's say in our PySpark development, we have to write a logic which will which will be used in multiple places. So instead of writing those particular logic in multiple places, we can create UDF. So basically we can put that particular piece of code into one of the UDF and it can be called later in multiple places. So we can avoid writing many lines of code again and again. So that is the uh, use of UDF. But at the same time, UDF is not recommended in PySpark development. Why? Because it is uh, creating negative impact in the performance. Uh, because whenever we are creating PySpark UDF, you know, that is going to be executed within the Python context within the executor. Basically, each executor will consist of, will have JVM uh, environment and also Python environment. So whenever we are going to use UDF, that particular logic will be executed within the Python environment, but the rest of the code will be executed in the JVM. So as a result, there will be context switching between uh, JVM environment to Python. So for each and every record, data serialization and deserialization will happen. So that is going to impact the performance. So UDF, PySpark UDF, that is always black box to Spark engine. So that is the reason it's uh, recommended to avoid UDF, but uh, wherever uh, you cannot avoid and you know, it's needed absolutely then we can go with UDF and also there are certain performance improvement methods for UDF that we can see in our next question. How to improve the performance of UDF in Spark development? Basically there are two major concepts available to improve uh, PySpark UDF in Spark development. The first one is we can register PySpark UDF. So whenever we are creating UDF in PySpark, we can directly use that without registering also. That is going to hit the performance because Spark engine cannot understand what is there inside Spark UDF. So as a result, the context switch will happen between JVM and Python, it is going to hit the performance. But whenever we are going to register a particular UDF, then Spark engine can understand the internal of UDF and it can perform certain Spark optimization. Performance optimization can be applied on top of that UDF. So as a result, it will improve the performance. So the first method is we have to use uh, registration of UDF. And uh, another benefit of uh, registration is whenever we are registering PySpark UDF, it can be used with SQL code as well. And coming to the second method of improving performance is Scala wrapper. 
So uh, whenever we are using Scala UDF, it is not going to impact the performance in PySpark, sorry, in uh, Spark development uh, because uh, Spark itself written in Scala language. So it's a nat native language. But whenever we are using PySpark UDF, then only it is going to hit the performance. So in order to avoid that, you know, uh, on top of uh, PySpark UDF, we can create something called Scala wrapper with the help of that. We can uh, run uh, PySpark uh, code as a Scala code. So we, it can be uh, Spark engine can optimize uh, that program. So these are the two common methods to improve the performance of uh, PySpark UDF. Moving on to next question. What is left anti join? This is also one of the basic question mostly asked for uh, junior uh, developers. So coming to left anti join. This is uh, you know one of the joining concept in uh, PySpark. And this is also a little uncommon compared to traditional uh, databases or data warehousing because uh, regularly we are having inner join, full outer join, left join, right join. You now these are the common joins available in any database. But coming to PySpark, it is having two special type of joins. One is left anti join. Coming to left anti join, whenever we have to uh, whenever we have to get um, uh, the non matching records from one of the data frame, then we can go with left anti join. So this is just opposite to inner join. So let's say we are having one left table and right table. We have to get only the non-matching records from the left table. Then we can go with left anti join. And moving on to the next question, what is left semi join? So earlier I told you know there are two uncommon joins available in Spark. This is the second one, left semi. Left semi. This is acting same like inner join, but at the same time it is going to give the list of columns only from the left table. So regularly, whenever we are joining using a inner join method, so it is going to find only the matching records and in the result resultant data set, it is going to include all the columns from both left and right table. But coming to left semi, it is going to consider only the matching records from both the tables. But at the same time, it is going to uh, it is going to display only the columns from the left table. So no columns from the right table. So this is the difference between left semi and uh, inner join. I hope uh, you understood. Moving on to next question, how to convert Spark data frame to Pandas data frame? This is also one of the very common question because in Spark development, Pandas, da Pandas data frame is also very commonly used because Pandas uh, library that is having very rich functionalities which can be uh, utilized uh, in our Spark development. So that is the reason in most of the scenarios, in most of the projects, we can see PySpark data frame that is being converted to Pandas data frame. So in order to convert that, it's very simple. First, we have to import Pandas library and with the help of Pandas library, we have to use the function to Pandas. That's it. Let's say we are having PySpark uh, data frame that is called a DF. Now we have to convert to Pandas data frame. Then we can use the syntax like DF dot two pandas open and close a bracket that's it moving on to the next question what is the difference between spark and pandas data frame this is also one of the important question so the interviewer might uh, uh, try to understand uh, your uh, knowledge on spark and also the distributed uh, processing coming to PySpark data frame that is uh, following the concept of distributed in memory parallel processing so whenever uh, we are uh, performing uh, certain data analytics, it is going to split the data in the form of partitions. It will be split. Uh, it will be distributed across multiple nodes in the cluster. Then it will uh, do the parallel processing. Then it will achieve the result in a quicker quicker manner. But coming to data frame, Pandas data frame, it is going to work in single node machine, which means it is a serial processor. So it is not going to uh, process uh, quickly because only one core will work at a time. So this is the key difference between PySpark data frame and Pandas data frame. So PySpark data frame that is working in the concept of uh, parallel processing, but uh, Pandas data frame that is working in the concept of uh, single node uh, processing. So as a result, whenever we have to process huge amount of data, it's always better to go with PySpark data frame. But whenever we have to process a small amount of data, then it's better to go with Pandas data frame because PySpark, you know, that is suitable for uh, processing heavy data only because initial setup it, uh, itself will take some time. So in case you have to process only small amount of data, it's better to go with Pandas data frame. Right. 
Moving on to next question, how to convert data frame column values into Python list? This is also one of the common requirement in most of the projects. Whenever we are working in real time projects, we will definitely come across this requirement. Let's say we are having a data frame which is having one of the column called country. Maybe we are having around 20 or 30 unique values in that country column. So let's say we have to get all the unique values into one of the list later. Later, we have to iterate uh, all the countries one by one for some other logic. So in this requirement, we have to get all the countries into one of the Python list. So for that, key is we have to use collect function. So let's say we are having data frame df, then df dot select, select only the column which is which we are interested in. Let's say country, df dot country, then we have to use collect function dot collect and whichever column we want to select out of that, you know, we can uh, use using a square bracket zero. In this case, we are going to uh, uh, we are going to get all the list of countries. So for that, we can use zero. That's it. This is very simple. Uh, uh, simple logic and uh, this is also most widely used. Moving on to next question, how to load data into Azure Synapse Analytics from Databricks. For that, we have to use the keyword. Uh, we are having a driver, you know, SQL DW, that is the format we have to use. This is one of the key in this answer. You know, the expectation from the interviewer is, are you uh, telling the correct format or not? So for uh, this particular uh, question, you know, let's say we are having data from DF that data should be written into one of the uh, synapse table. So for that, we have to use spark.write. Then we have to use format within the format. We have to use uh, SQL DW format. Then we have to use uh, a JDBC connection. We have to give URL. That is uh, uh, the, in the option we have to give URL and the JDBC connection URL we need to give. And also we have to give database name, table name, username, password and also mode. The more you know it's append or overwrite, you know, those information can be given. So uh, this is how we can write data frame data into Synapse table. Right, moving on to next question. What is pre-action and post-action SQL in, a, in Synapse data loading? So in my previous question, I talked about how to load data frame data into Synapse table. So for that, we have to use SQL DW uh, format and also we have to use JDBC connection. So along with that, optionally, we are having uh, pre-action SQL and post-action SQL. So let's say we have to load data frame data into one of the table. So before loading the current data frame data, we have to truncate that table every time. Then what we can do is we can specify the option of pre-action SQL. In the pre-action SQL, we can supply truncate command for the table. So before writing the actual data into the table, first it will execute the pre-action command. And similarly, let's say we are loading uh, certain data into uh, Synapse table. Then after that, we have to make some changes to the table. Let's say we have to uh, activate certain flag. Then we can supply some you know, update statement along with post action SQL. So pre action SQL is nothing but in case we have to perform certain operation before loading our data frame data, then uh, we can uh, define uh, SQL command that is pre action SQL. Coming to post action SQL, after loading our data, in case we need to perform certain operation in the Synapse table, then we can define that command in post action SQL. Right. Moving on to next question. How can we read write data frame relational databases to Databricks? This is also one of the very common question in most of the Databricks interviews. So in order to read or write uh, data from relational databases, we have to use JDBC connector. This is the key we need to answer. And along with that, JDBC connection, you know, that is one of the performance bottleneck in Databricks development. So in order to overcome that, we can uh, enable concurrent uh, uh, connections. So for that, we have to use uh, partition, we have to enable partition. So num partition, you know, that is one of the option we need to specify and which partition key that also we have to tell. And also we can uh, use the, uh, the options uh, lower bound, upper bound. Now these are the different options we can talk about for this particular question. Moving on to next question, what is window function in Spark? This is one of the uh, commonly used uh, uh, transformation in PySpark. Coming to window, whenever we have to perform certain uh, data analytics or data transformation in a data set, we are going to split that data into multiple windows. Then after that, we are applying certain logic on each window that is called window function. Let's say uh, we are having a data frame which is having multiple countries. So for each country, we are having 10 records. Now what we can do is we can uh, create window for each country. So uh, for each country, 
10 records would be there. Within that, we can apply window functions such as rank, row number, tens rank, lead, lag, first, max. You know, there are various window functions available. So we can apply. So basically, we are dividing the data into windows and applying certain logic for each window. That is called window function. I have already posted one video, video number 71. You can watch to get more information about that. Moving on to next question. What are the transformations you applied frequently in Spark development? This is one of the generic question. Definitely you can expect this question in most of the interviews for junior developers. So in order to answer this question, you have to tell, you know, the most commonly used transformations such as a filter, uh, order by, uh, adding a new column using with column, or renaming a column using with uh, with column renamed, uh, joining two different data sets, applying window functions, aggregate functions, uh, adding unique key with the help of uh, monotonically increasing ID. Now these are the different transformations you can mention. Whatever uh, transformations you have applied practically in your project, you can include. Moving on to next question. What is the use of libraries and how to install uh, libraries in Databricks? Library is nothing but it's a piece of code already you know, compiled and it is having a lot of functionalities. So in our project, in case we need certain functionality from the library, then instead of writing uh, lengthy code, we can simply import uh, readily available libraries, then simply we can use the functionality. So with the help of a library, we can avoid writing huge uh, or uh, many lines of code. That is library and how to install library in Databricks. Now there are various methods to install library in Databricks. Let's say we can, um, uh, we have to install at cluster level. For that, open the cluster and go to libraries section. Within libraries, we can uh, click on uh, install library. Then it will ask uh, which type of library we have to install. Maven, PyPy, you know, it is giving different options. Now based on that, we can choose the library and we can install. Or we can install library at notebook level also. For that, we have to use pip command, pip install, then that particular library name. Now, these are the different approaches to install library in Databricks. Moving on to next question, how to schedule a notebook at regular interval? For that, in, note, uh, in Databricks, we are having a concept of workflow. So, we have to create a workflow. Within workflow, we have to create task. You now, for each task, we have to choose the notebook, which notebook uh, to be executed. And also we can uh, chain multiple tasks or multiple notes, uh, notebooks together. For example, execute this particular notebook. Once that is completed, then uh, execute another notebook. So we can create uh, orchestration by combining multiple notebooks as well. And also we can define schedule for each task. You know, when that should be executed that we can mention. So in order to answer this question, the key is we have to create a workflow. Within workflow, we have to create task. Right. How to remove cached data out of spark memory so cache persist you know these are different uh, uh, you know performance optimization concepts available in uh, spark so in case you, know, you have applied cache on a big data frame and later you know, it is occupying more memory in your spark and you have to remove out of your memory then uh, what command we need to use so normally people used to uh, you know get confused uh, using uncache command but in PySpark, we don't have such command. So in order to remove the cached data, we have to use the command called unpersist. That is the key for this question. Moving on to the last question, how to handle bad records while reading via Spark Reader? So this is one of the important question in uh, Spark uh, Data Frame Reader. So whenever we are reading data from uh, big data file formats such as CSV, Parquet, JSON, you know, we can handle bad records. So for that, we have to um, use the option of mode. In the mode, we have to tell you know, which uh, kind of bad records handling mechanism we have to use. Basically, there are three types of bad records handling method. One is permissive. Second one is uh, uh, drop malformed. Third one is fail fast. So permissive, even though if there is a corrupted record, still you uh, permit that, you allow that. That's the meaning of permissive. Coming to drop malformed, remove the corrupted records and uh, go ahead with the process and the third one fail first you know as soon as uh, we encounter some corrupted record fail the entire process you know these are the different methods available to handle bad records in spark still there are so many questions related to spark development i will uh, post in the upcoming videos hope you understood and enjoyed this video if you like the content of this video please like comment and uh, in the channel also please subscribe this channel don't forget to click on the bell button 
to get more updates and uh, videos on databricks thank you